All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Roger Wombolt. I'm Global Training Coordinator with Corel Corporation, and you're tuned in to this introductory session for Corel Draw Graphics Suite X7. Over the next uh, two hours, we'll be taking a look at the interface in Corel Draw. I'll be showing uh, how to use uh, some of the tools, features, and effects in the application. We'll cover off a number of uh, tips and tricks and that sort of thing. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should have a question panel. Do feel free to uh, type any questions that you may have throughout the session into that panel. I'll endeavor to answer those as we go along. Uh, failing that, at the end of the session, I'll definitely be uh, opening up the lines and answering any uh, unanswered questions at that time. So without further ado, let's uh, just jump right in. What you're looking at right now is the interface for uh, Corel Draw, and let me just launch my welcome screen now. In the event that we don't have the welcome screen opened up, which typically will open up when you first launch the application, then I can click on this icon right up here someplace. And it looks like I'm using a, a different screen. Bear, bear with me. All right, so this is my uh, welcome screen. I did have it open, that's why I'm not seeing that icon. Uh, the, uh, the welcome screen basically starts off with a getting started panel. In the getting started, this is where you're going to create a new document. I can go new from template, or I can open up a recent document. This is basically a list of some of the documents that I've had opened uh, that I've been working on over the past little while. And I, as you can see, as I hover over these, I can get a preview of that uh, particular document I'm working, well, uh, working on as well as where it's located, file size, and various things like that. The next one down is workspace, and this is something new that we've added in X7, and that's the ability to access the workspaces right forefront. I have a light workspace, classic workspace, which resembles that of CorelDRAW Graphics Suite X6. The default uh, workspace, and then of course I have two advanced workspaces, one for illustration, one for page design, and then for those that are uh, new to CorelDRAW or are very familiar with Adobe Illustrator, there's also the Adobe Illustrator workspace. And when we talk about workspaces, we also have workspaces in Photo Paint, and in Photo Paint there is a Photoshop workspace. So if your tools of choice are uh, Corel Draw and uh, Adobe Photoshop, which uh, which many people uh, do have that uh, that selection, if you do need to use Photo Paint, you can of course make it look like Photoshop and be a little bit more comfortable. Personally, I prefer the classic workspace simply because it's uh, I'm more more uh, uh, more familiar with that one. Under the What's New. Here I have the ability of taking a look at the new features that have been added to Graphics uh, uh, Suite X7 over X6. And in fact, we, uh, when we come out with uh, dot increment patches, and what I mean by that is the current version for CorelDRAW Graphics Suite X7 is 7.3. We've added, with each of these dot increments, we've added additional features for premium members. Uh, those features are basically listed through here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so these ones are some of the new features we've added for premium members with the dot three, uh, sorry, dot one, two, and three uh, updates. And then, of course, down here, uh, default workspace and classic workspace is basically explains uh, a little bit about that sort of thing. Under the Need Help is where you're going to find a plethora of tutorials. There is about two and a half hours of video tutorials, as well as a number of video hints that you can, uh, that you can cycle through and take a look at the, the hints on how to do uh, various things in the applications. Uh, this is Insights from the Experts, which is basically uh, projects that were created by users of the application, and then they tear apart the project that they've done and shown how it was done. Here, for example, um, this was done by uh, Fernando Gonzalez, who is one of our, uh, he's on our development team, and he's actually created a cookbook using CorelDRAW that's being sold down in Venezuela. It's all Venezuelan cooking. Uh, the gallery is there simply to give you inspiration of uh, uh, Artwork others have created with the application. You can look through that and get some ideas for for design work and whatnot, and just see what the the um, abilities or capabilities are of uh, of CorelDRAW. 
updates, of course, will uh, point out if there are any updates available, and you can certainly select that. That's not a problem at all. CorelDraw.com is the Corel community where you can uh, view various galleries, tips, tricks. There's blogs there as well, and uh, you pick up some, some useful information. Memberships and subscriptions, and then, of course, a link to the Discovery Center. Now, the Discovery Center is uh, created to allow you to learn how to use the application in a variety of different ways. You can go through CorelDRAW and access it. Alter alternatively, you can go to learn.corel.com, and that will take you to the Discovery Center as well. All right, let's go ahead and I'm going to uh, go into our uh, back to our file. One thing you'll notice is across the top we have these tabs. And actually, we're, we're starting to take a look at the actual interface. So across the top, we'll start with our drop-down menus. These are standard drop-down menus uh, where you'll get uh, the, uh, the bulk of your commands that you want to use within the application. Below that is a standard toolbar, things such as new document, open, save, print, cut, copy, paste, that sort of thing. Below that is our interactive property bar, also called the context-sensitive property bar. And the nice thing about this particular bar is it will change depending on the tool that you have selected. And it basically gives additional flexibility or additional uh, properties for these various tools uh, within the toolbox. The uh, left-hand side, as I mentioned, this is our toolbox. Any icon that has a little black triangle on the bottom right-hand corner, that's an indication that there is additional tools buried underneath that. You'll notice the tabs across the top. If I create a new document, it's simply a matter of clicking on the plus. I can set my proper, uh, parameters for that new document. I've now created a new document. I'm ready to design this. This happens to be a business card. You'll notice that I have my tabs across the top, and I can switch back and forth. If I happen to be using dual monitor, I can also take these tabs, pull them off, and I can slide this to a different monitor if I wanted to do that. Let me just pull this back over here and close this. Now, um, looking further down, along the bottom we have page navigation. So this is beginning of the document. I can go to the end of the document. I can back up a number of pages, or I can go to wherever I want to. I can go to a specific page as well. So it's a great way to, to uh, navigate through my document. Below that is my document color palette. If I create a new document, you'll notice that my document palette is empty. If I draw an object on this page and I give it a color, I'll give it a, a green uh, fill, and I'm going to give it a red outline, you'll notice that I have the green and red in there. So the document palette gets built as you're designing your application, or as you're designing your file, rather. Down the right, or just, above, just below the document palette is the status bar. And the status bar is uh, an indication as to what you currently have selected. If you're trying to do something in the application and it doesn't seem to be working as you think it should, take a look in the status bar. That may give you an indication as to why it may or may not be working. For example, if I had two pieces of text selected, and I'll just create another one here, or if I have two objects selected, one is text, I want to edit this text. It's not allowing me to edit it. I'll see my status bar, and it's a group of two objects. If I ungroup those and then select my text, it will tell me in the status bar that I have text selected, and I can now go ahead and edit my text. So the status bar is very important. On the right-hand side, I have my color palettes. I actually have two of them open right now. I'm going to close one of them off. To close it off, I'll simply undock it. This particular color palette is my RGB palette. This is my CMYK. I'll just close that off. And let me just go ahead and dock this back over here. So that's my document palette over here. And uh, again, the status bar will also show me if I have an object selected and I give it a color fill. My status bar tells me the color of the fill as well as the color of the outline. Okay, let's go on to the next, uh, next slide. 
Uh, workspace customization. I like to, to talk about this right at the beginning of this session simply because it hopefully will sit in the back of your mind and think, well, gee, I can see myself using that particular tool a lot. Maybe I want to customize it to make it easier to access. If you know that workspace customization is fairly easy to use uh, and, and to do, then you'll probably go ahead and do that and save yourself an awful lot of time in in designing. Um, there are certain tools that I use in the application and certain keyboard shortcuts that I use a lot and so I do uh, I do do some customization to my uh, to my workspace. Creating toolbars is extremely easy. Some of the tools that I use uh, are things such as the drop shadow, the transparency. If I want to create a custom toolbar I'm going to hold down the control plus alt key this is my drop shadow tool, so I'll just click and hold. I'll grab the drop shadow, left click and drag while holding down the Control plus Alt key, and I'll just let that go. I've now started to build a custom toolbar. I want contour added to that as well. I want transparency. And the other one I do a lot of is fit text to path. So let me just move this out of the way. Hold the Control plus Alt. Go to my text menu, and I get, it doesn't matter if it's grayed out or not. I'll simply select Fit Text to Path, drag and drop, and I can put that wherever I want to on the toolbar. I'll, let's put it right at the very beginning. So very quick and very easy to customize your interface, and I can now take this toolbar and drag and drop that wherever I want to. Let me just move that down onto this one. So here we have my... Um, my new toolbar, so if I draw a rectangle, for example, give it a solid fill, I can click on the drop shadow and basically give that a drop shadow very quick and very easy. Uh, <clears throat> other customizations that I do a lot are some keyboard shortcuts. To do that, I'm going to go to my Tools menu, down to Customization. Now in here, I want to select Commands. The keyboard shortcuts I use a lot are for wireframe and enhanced view. So under the file menu, wireframe and enhanced are both found under view. So I'll scroll down to wireframe. And my keyboard shortcut that I use there is the letter W. So simply type in W and I assign it. To get out of wireframe, I want to go to enhanced. And in here, I'm going to type the letter Q. The reason I'm not using the letter E is because it's certainly it's currently assigned for even alignment. And an easy way to remember it is uh, Q is quit wireframe. They're also side by side on the keyboard, so it makes it a lot easier for me to toggle back and forth. Uh, another view that I use is page sorter view. I quite often uh, deal with multi-page documents. As you can see, this particular one is 32 pages. Just type the letter S for sorter and assign. And I'll click OK to that. Now if I tap the letter W, I go into wireframe. Q is to quit wireframe. I go back and forth very quickly and uh, go into page sort of view, grab a page. So you can see very easy to move around the document just by creating a couple little shortcut keys. Once I've done that, I can go to my tools menu, down to options, and if I highlight workspace, I now have the ability of exporting this workspace. And when I export it, I can either send it out as a, uh, keep it as a file, or email it. So if I have CorelDRAW Graphics Suite X7 on my home system, as well as my office system, or let's say I'm part of a design group, maybe there's four designers and we all want to use the same workspace, then we can certainly share workspaces, and share keyboard shortcuts and that sort of thing. So it makes it a lot easier. Uh, <clears throat> page setup. We've seen the page setup uh, in uh, in creating a new document. So this is creating a new document. This is my page setup uh, dialog box. Here you'll see that I have a number of different preset destinations. If I'm doing a t-shirt uh, design, this is actually a, a custom one that I created. Um, so you can create custom uh, destinations. This t-shirt one, for example, when I select that, it'll be a 13 by 19. Uh, it uses RGB color model, and it uses a 300 DPI resolution. So you can cur cer certainly create your own custom preset destinations. I can also select uh, specific page sizes, letter, legal, tabloid, 
uh, as well as the drafting sizes and international sizes as well. The primary color model, or color mode rather, will dictate what color palette appears on the screen by default. Uh, typically, if you're going to be using CMYK, it's because you're going to four color press. Uh, if you're doing sublimation, screen printing, t-shirt design, anything like that, you would typically use RGB, as RGB has a much larger color gamut to it. The rendering resolution, that's the resolution that lenses and drop shadows are created at. Any bitmap effects in Corel Draw, such as uh, the bevel, when you create a bevel, it will create a bitmap. That bitmap resolution will be 300 dpi. The, um, uh, and that's basically the new document. Now, another way to get into uh, changing the document parameters is if I double click the shadow of the page, it will also bring me into my page size uh, uh, area where I can change the page size, adjust it. I can also do other things such as background. Maybe I want a solid colored background uh, for my document. I can certainly do that. Not a problem at all. I can also tell it that I want to print the background as well as export it. Uh, let's say, for example, I'm doing a, um, um, what's a good example? I'm doing a, a, a report cover. The report cover is uh, going to be navy blue, but I'm printing it on a, on a dark blue stock. So I can actually dial up that particular color in here. So as I do the design work, I'm actually designing it on, on the, what the color would look like. Um, now, what happened there? Windows. Uh, now, over on the right-hand side, typically we would find dockers. I currently don't have any opened up. So let me open up a couple of dockers. By default, my object manager docker would appear. And let me just uh, delete these. So by default, my object manager would appear. The other docker that's opened by default is the hints docker. Uh, one thing about the hints docker, particularly for those that are new to the application, is when I select a tool, the hints docker is going to change, and it's going to show me how to use that tool. Here, for example, I'm just going to draw a rectangle, and then as far as giving that a fill, left click will change the fill, right click changes the outline, and I'll change the width of that outline just so you can see it better. And if I uh, right-click in the X, that's going to remove the fill. Now, what we're seeing right now on my screen, that blue icon that was spinning, uh, what's happening at that point when you see that? The application is doing an auto backup, and it's, an, it's a good idea just to leave the mouse alone and let it, let it do that, that thing. Uh, to remove the outline, right-click on the X. I'm going to create an ellipse. And you'll see that my hints docker has changed. It's showing me how to do an ellipse. I'll give this a fill, and then I'll remove the outline. I'm going to come over here to my interactive tools, and I'm going to grab a blend. So as soon as I click on blend, it shows me how to use that tool. If there's not enough information in here, I can click on learn more in the help, and it will navigate directly to the help file. Let's just click and drag. And that's all there is to it. So it's very easy to uh, learn the application with the various tools. Uh, also on the video, this is another access to the, the video hints that you can go through, and it shows you how to do something as simple as drawing a rectangle, how to skew or rotate that rectangle, and that sort of thing. Um, where are page setup alignment guides. So you saw a bunch of lines on my page a moment ago. Those were guidelines. If I need to bring guidelines out, I can left click and drag, and that will allow me to bring a guideline on the page. I can bring out horizontal guidelines as well as vertical guidelines. Also, if I click on a guideline, I now have the ability to rotate that if I wanted to align stuff to that. I'm going to undo these guidelines. And the next one I want to show is alignment guides. So from the view menu, I'll go to alignment guides. I've now turned those on. And uh, I've got a bit of an issue with my, with my vision. Uh, so what I like to do is under the dockers, I go to uh, alignment and dynamic guidelines. And in the docker, I'm going to change the color of that. And I usually go for the chocolate brown. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier to see uh, the guidelines for me anyway. And the way they work, is I'll grab a rectangle, 
uh, the rectangle tool, and you'll note that as I move around the screen, these lines will appear in certain positions. So right now, if I draw a rectangle, the top is going to be aligned with the top of that bitmap to the left. I'll draw this rectangle, and now again, I'm aligned with the top. I'm now the same height, and I'm now the same width as this previous rectangle. So very easy to um, create objects and have them all the same size. Simple as that. Uh, so that's, that's basically how your alignment guides work. Now the object manager, to, to show the object manager, I want to create a new document. Uh, the object manager with this particular document is kind of busy. You'll see it in a moment when I go back there. Uh, the object manager is open by default and it basically lets you know or shows you where the various objects are within the document and the properties of those. I'm going to draw a rectangle. I'll give it a yellow fill and I'm going to give it a green outline. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> I can also click on this icon for more details. And now if I expand this a bit, you'll see that I have a rectangle and it gives me my fill and my outline color. I, I'm going to turn off these uh, alignment guides for now. So if I now draw a, an ellipse, or I use the graph paper tool, as I draw these various elements, it's going to give me uh, information in my uh, object docker about these elements. I can create new layers, and I can draw elements on, the, on those layers. The active layer is the layer that is in red. If I wanted to, and let me draw a couple more elements on this. I, you'll notice I have some icons here. I can select this element and this one here, and Control G will group those. So we can see that we have a group of elements objects here. I have the ability of making this layer invisible or I can make this one invisible. I can make it so this does not print. And so if I go print right now and I show you the print preview window, you'll only see that one, uh, uh, one item. This is my mini print preview. I can turn that off and I can go full screen print preview right here. Uh, I prefer to keep the mini print preview on. It's a little bit quicker than having to go into the full screen print preview. And it's just a matter of clicking on this double-ended arrow to show my, my preview. They hit cancel on that. And let's take the uh, um, enable the print on this. And this one is lock or unlock. So with this locked, I can now marquee select everything on the page and hit the delete key. Well, nothing happened to this because that was locked. A scenario where you might want to use that is if you are, uh, let's say you're um, tracing an image. You're doing a t-shirt design. You've got a pencil sketch. You've scanned that pencil sketch in. It's on your page, and you're now drawing it in Corel Draw. Well, you can actually put that pencil sketch on a separate layer and lock it and then uh, continue to draw, and it won't move that image around. You could then set it to not, that layer to not print, and when you print, you'll only print the sketch, uh, or you'll, you'll only print what you've drawn, not the sketch that you scanned in. So that's basically the uh, object manager. I'm just going to close this off, and we're back into uh, our file here. Now, talk a little bit about file formats. Uh, there are two main graphic um, classifications of files. That would be a vector file format and a raster file format. I'm sure you've all heard the term bitmap. Uh, bitmap is a raster file format. That's like saying I've got a, a Kleenex when in actual fact it's a tissue. So it's not a bitmap, it's a raster image. And a raster image is made up of pixels. If I take a look at this image here, I zoom right in, you can actually see the individual pixels within this design. Uh, an advantage to a raster image is that you can get beautiful continuous tones, shadows and shading and highlights in an image. The drawback is that I can typically only increase a raster image by about 
before I start losing quality. Uh, some of the raster file formats include the uh, PSD, which is the Photoshop. CPT is, uh, is a Corel Photo Paint. Then, of course, PSD, JPEG, GIF, PNG, uh, those, uh, those last three are all web-based uh, type file, file, or I shouldn't say web-based type file formats, but they're file formats that you can use on the web. Um, CDR, EPS, AI, DXF, WMF, those are all vector file formats. And a vector file uh, or a vector, a vector file format is a format that is mathematical calculations making up line segments that have start and end points and points along the way. These points are referred to as nodes, and there's typically three types of nodes. I will talk about those a little bit later on. But that basically allows me to take a vector file, vector uh, object, and change the shape of it uh, like that. The draw, uh, the um, advantage to having a vector file format is file size is typically a lot smaller. And I can take a one inch by one inch vector file and I can make it 100 inches by 100 inches and it'll be still clean, crisp and sharp and I'll be able to use that file quite nicely. Okay, uh, I'm going to do a shift F4 that's going to zoom to everything on the page or F4 will zoom to my entire page. Let me just collapse this uh, object manager a little bit. Gives me a little bit more room in here to, to play around. Uh, Corel Connect is the solution we have for accessing content on the web uh, and, and on our, uh, our, our digital asset server. Uh, to access Corel Connect, there's a couple of different ways to do it. First of all, Corel Connect is a standalone application, so I can launch it by itself. When I do launch it, I can bring content into the various trays. If I then go into CorelDRAW or into PhotoPaint, I'll be able to access that content directly in there. The, um, <clears throat> another way to access the Corel Connect is from my Windows menu. I go down to Dockers, and then I'll have Corel Connect in here where I can access it. But much easier is to simply click on this icon right here, and that's going to access the uh, um, Corel Connect for me, or it's going to launch it rather. It takes a few seconds to, to launch it, but I see it appear on the right hand side. And then what I'll do is I'll go to my window menu, down to Dockers, and I'm going to open up the tray. Uh, the tray parks itself along the bottom, and you can see I have uh, a number of different trays in here. I can certainly uh, close these off. I can delete trays. I can add more trays. I can rename the trays. Uh, and you would typically use a tray if you're creating a, a project. You know, these trays could be uh, a project-based. So here, for example, uh, I'm doing up a brochure uh, for a customer, maybe for a wine festival or whatever the case may be. Uh, in, um, in Corel Connect, I can do a search. Uh, we have Christmas coming up, so let's just type in Christmas, and I'll do a search. It's going to go through and it's going to find a number of images, and I can change the size of these thumbnails. And uh, make it smaller. So here's a nice little image. It's the Santa Claus. I drag and drop, and I can just put that right into the tray. Uh, I like this. Uh, the snow scene is kind of nice. Again, drag and drop. Some of these images, if I'm using them, they come from a variety of different sources. If I drag and drop, it may tell me that there's copyright uh, information on that. I want to click OK, and it's now dropped that in. If I go and modify this, if this happens to be an image um, from uh, a service, then uh, and that's not, let me get one that is, um, close this off by hitting this little triangle, and I'll turn off the content exchange. I'm just going to search Flickr, Fotolio, and iStock. I'll click on the search. And here's one here. Let's take this Fotolio image. I'll drag and drop. It may be copyright restrictions. I can take this, and if I was to change color, resize, crop, or whatever it is, I show it to my customer. The customer's happy with it. I can simply right-click on this, and I can tell it to replace the comp. If I have the, uh, the original on my desktop, or if I select Open Comp Source, then it's going to go to the Fotolio site, and it's going to allow me to purchase whatever size uh, of this image that I want to. So direct connections in here makes it really easy to use. Another thing I can do in here is www. Um, 
O-C-J-O-H dot C-A. That's a local TV station. And I'm actually going out and I'm searching their website right now. And what that's going to do is it's going to pull content from the website and it will display it on the screen for me here. Uh, it doesn't seem to be wanting to, so let me try something else. I may not have had the right, right URL, I'm just making that up. Uh, so abc.com, uh, it brought that out, and I can use the ABC logo. Here's some uh, imagery from the different shows. That one looks like Scandal. Uh, my wife watches that. Um, so there's a, you know, very easy for me to go out and, and drag the content, drop it on the screen. Again, because there was copyright restrictions on some of this stuff, we're letting you know about that. I can also uh, drag and drop, uh, as I say, from the tray, and I can bring that up and use that uh, in my design and, and, uh, and play with it that way. All right, let's go on to the next page. Uh, let me close off uh, Corel Connect. And we'll close off the tray. All right, now we're going to get into uh, some of the tools that, uh, that we use in, uh, in CorelDRAW. The um, selecting, uh, I've been using my, my cursor, this little arrow thing, um, since we started this session. This arrow thing is called, actually called the, the pick tool. It allows me to pick up an object and move it. Uh, in other words, select an object and move it. If I want to select multiple objects, I can, actually, let me ungroup that. Selecting multiple objects, I can draw a frame around the area that I want to select and then just simply move those over. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that I've actually grabbed a couple of other elements. Do a control Z. When I do a, what we call a marquee selection, the elements that I'm selecting have to be completely encompassed by this frame uh, before they can be selected. And so there we have that. Uh, if I don't have them completely uh, encompassed, such as in this scenario, it will not select anything. I can, however, if I want, hold down the Alt key, and now whatever this cursor touches, or this frame touches, will become selected. And there you can see that. Now, here's a little trick that not a lot know. I'm going to left click and draw a frame. With the left mouse button held down, I'm going to hold down the right mouse button as well. And now I can move my cursor in here, let go of the right mouse button, let go of the left mouse button, and it did not work. Just a second here. Oh, that's because I ungrouped it. Okay. Uh, that's because I had, un I had done a control Z too many times and the whole thing was grouped. So let's try that again. Let go of the right mouse button, let go of the left mouse button, and there you have it. That works well with some of the drawing tools as well. I want to draw a rectangle, but actually I want my rectangle in the middle of the circle. So with the left mouse button held down, I'm going to hold down the right mouse button, and I can move that to wherever I want to quite easily. Control Z a couple of times. There we go. So that's a, a couple of ways of selecting. I can also use my tab key to select. And that's a useful thing to remember. Uh, it's useful in a couple of ways. First off, using the tab key will select objects in the order that they were created. Shift tab will do it in reverse order. Now, one, where, one area where that might be handy is if I've got a corrupt file and I'm trying to troubleshoot that file, I may need to select some very small items. Using the tab key will allow me to select that without having to zoom right in to find the specific element that I'm looking for. So there's something to remember. So I've got this selected, and I'm going to do some coloring now. I'll hit the tab key and click on the yellow. Tab red, tab pink, tab purple, tab orange. I don't want too pink, so let's go green. So very quick and very easy to select these elements. Now, I'm going to go through and select these. I'll hold the shift key down. And I'm going to select these objects. I'll select the pink one last, or magenta one last. Now, I want to align these. So if I want to align everything with the top, it's based on the last object selected. So I'll tap the letter T for top. And as you can see, they've all aligned with the top of that pink element. B for bottom. 
R for right, L for left, C for center, and E for even. Let's undo this. We'll do it again. Now I'm going to select the uh, purple object last. Hold the shift key down. And again, T for top, B for bottom, L for left, R for right, C for center, and E for even. Now that's great if you're typing objects or if you, let's say you need to, uh, you're doing a form and uh, your form has little boxes and you want to make sure that they're all lined up, marquee select them, L for left align, shift C for center, and if I had them this way, B for bottom, shift E for even. So even, center. Uh, with the shift key held down, will it evenly adjust the space or properly center them? Uh, copying and pasting versus duplicating, or copy versus duplicate and paste special. When I take an element and I do a control C and a control V, what you saw there is that little blue circle spinning around was actually Corel Draw taking these elements and creating a temporary file into the Windows temp directory and then dropping the contents of that file back down onto the page. And that's typically what happens when you do a copy-paste. It's in memory right now, and so I can simply go paste, paste. All I'm doing is Control V and then moving it out of the way. Okay. It's grabbing that information from that temp file. Problem with temp files is if you get too many, it can cause the system to slow down. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I suffice to say, if I wanted a copy of this, easiest way to do it is Control-D uh, for a duplicate. Now I'm going to zoom in on this. And if I take this and I can move this over here, you'll see that I've actually got two copies. We have something called Smart Duplicate. So if I take this element and I do a Control-D, and I now take this and I move it over, I can do another control D and it will remember this spacing. If I had gone and I had done a control D, I'll move it over and I'll make it a little bit smaller. And now if I do a control D, watch what happens. So it's remembering those, those moves. That's called a smart duplicate. One thing more you can do with the Smart Duplicate is I can actually use on my interactive property bar, I can use mathematical formulas in here. We'll see that this particular uh, object is one inch horizontal by one inch vertical. I've got a copy of it over top of the original, and in here I want to add the width of that object, which is one inch, and I want to add um, 5.5 millimeters. So I can actually uh, do various uh, operations in here, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. I can also mix, uh, mix and match units, units of measure. I'll hit enter, and this is now 5.5 millimeters across. Well, Smart Duplicate remembers that. And now I'm going to take these objects. It's in the process of doing a backup, so I'm just going to hold on. I'm not going to touch my mouse or anything. I'm going to take these objects, I'll do a control D, and here I'm going to do a minus because I want it to go down, 1 minus 5.5 mm. Control D. So very easy if you wanted to create a grid, if you want to do a chart, I'm just going to do a series of control Zs here. Very easy if you want to do a grid or a chart or anything like that. The next is paste special. If I go to my edit menu, I have an option to paste. And so it's actually pasted that object back in. That's the same thing as a control V. If I take an element from Illustrator or uh, Excel and copy and paste it into Corel Draw, I'll actually have an option for paste special. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to place what's called an OLE or OLE object in Corel Draw. If I take this element and drag that 
you'll see that as I drag and I'm seeing a design, uh, or I'm seeing what that object is, is made up of as a blue uh, outline. If I take this element and drag it, you'll notice that there's a diagonal blue line bottom left-hand corner. That's a telltale indication that this is an Olay object. So what's an Olay object? It stands for Object Link and Embedding. And if I double-click this, it's actually going to launch a shell of Excel directly within Corel Draw. I can come in here, I can take this element, and I want to make that text red. Maybe I want to make it bold. I want to have this piece of text down here. Oh, let's make it green. I guess the point I'm making is that uh, with an Olay object, I have the ability to edit that in the host application. A perfect example where I would use this is I'm doing a brochure or, or a, let's say a parts catalog. And manufacturing says to me, here's a spreadsheet uh, of all the parts, but we might be changing one or two of those before it actually goes to production. Well, you can be working on that manual for the product, and then just before it goes to production, we know what the new parts are. You can simply click on this spreadsheet in your design, make the updates. Once you've done your updates, click outside, and it will automatically update in the file. So it's a great way to save time, but it can cause uh, complexities in the design. So if you don't need to use an Olay object, don't do it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's uh, continue now. We're going to take a look at, um, excuse me, um, shaping and shape tools and creating objects. So in here, there are a number of tools that allow us to draw vector objects. I'll start with uh, this element here. Now, I've mentioned the uh, interactive property bar at the top. The object that I select is going to change depending on, or sorry, the property bar at the top is going to change depending on the object I have selected. For example, I've got this rectangle selected. I can uh, use my shape tool and round the corners of that. I also have the ability of changing the way those corners are, are affected. The same goes for an ellipse. I can make that into a pie shape or I can make it into an arc. Well, with the shape tool, I can do that as well. If my cursor is on the outside of the object, I'm creating an arc. If my cursor is on the inside, I'm creating a pie shape. If I move it to the outside, it now becomes an arc. So depending on what's on your interactive property bar, we'll, we'll give you more flexibility. Let's do a couple of undos to get this back to where I want it. Now, I'm going to select this red element, hold the shift key down, I'll select the green, and you'll notice that I have some shaping commands. These are available from the Arrange menu under Shaping, but personally I find it a lot quicker just to use my interactive property bar. The first one is Combine, and what Combine will do is it will create a knockout where the objects overlap. So this is actually uh, empty inside here. It'll also change the properties of the object based on the last object selected. So I'm going to select the green element first, and then the red element, and I'll do my weld. They both turned red because red was the last element that I selected. Control Z. Next is weld, and weld as in taking two pieces of metal, it fuses the two into the one. Do a Control Z to undo. I'm going to select this, this, and this. I've got the three elements selected. The other one I want to talk about is the simplify. Now, there are other commands here. I'm going to suggest that you experiment and just play around with them. Uh, I'm going to select the simplify. Simplify acts as a cookie cutter, and it cuts out from uh, all levels. So if I remove this red object, it will have cut out of the green as well as the blue and the, the green will cut out from the blue as well. Okay. Now, uh, so that's, that's basically the shaping commands. Other commands for creating objects and shaping objects are in the, the crop, the knife, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Let me grab my shape, uh, under the shape tool, there's a new tool that we introduced in X7, it's called the smooth tool. 
If I grab my shape tool and I select this beer mug, you'll see at the top, it's actually a power clipped object, which we'll talk about later as well, but you'll see there's quite a few nodes. Anybody who does vinyl cutting, those nodes are not much fun. Uh, it can cause a lot of problems depending on the, uh, the software that you're using and the way you're cutting and whatnot, in that it can cause a knife to, to basically jump between nodes. We've added a new tool, it's a smoothing tool. I'll select that and I can change my brush size and drop that down a bit. All I'm doing is brushing over the top of this area. I'll go back to my smoothing tool, our shape tool rather, and you can see the number of nodes has dropped down quite a bit. So a great way to reduce the complexity uh, of an element is to uh, just use the smoothing tool. Now we talked a bit uh, earlier about nodes uh, when we were talking about the file formats, vector versus raster. Um, let me just go ahead, I'm going to grab my uh, freehand drawing tool. And what I'm going to do is we're going to recreate this element based on what we've just learned over here with respect to welding and trimming. First of all, I'm going to left click, let the mouse button go, move to wherever I want to. If I left click again, it's going to end that line for me. You'll notice that my cursor, if I move it to that last node, I now have a downward pointing arrow. If I left click here, it now allows me to actually join to that previous one. So I can double click here. And now I've created a, a solid or created an object that is a closed path and I'm able to give it a color. If I left click, hold the button down and drag, I'm creating an irregular shaped object. And I'll come back to this point, let the mouse button go, and again, I've now created an object that looks like a whale. <laughs> Sorry. I've now created an object that I can give a color uh, or a solid fill to it. So let's take this element and I want to draw that. Now we talked in the object manager about the ability to lock a layer uh, and so the stuff doesn't move around in this type of scenario. I don't want this to move around. Instead of locking this specific layer, where you can see that there's a lot of stuff on the layer, I'll simply right click on this and I have the ability to lock object. So now this will not move around. I'm just going to zoom in on it. Uh, what I did there, another sh shortcut if you will, uh, my, uh, my mouse has a roller ball in the center. It allows me to zoom in and zoom out. If my control key is held down, it allows me to pan left to right. Um, so what I did is with my roller ball, instead of rolling it forward and backward, if I push it straight down and then move my mouse, I can actually pan around within the document. So if I'm working in tight quarters up here, and now I want to go down to the bottom of the mug, I can push it straight down and just move that right back down. And it will not change from whatever tool I have selected. So for example, I still have my ellipse tool selected. Uh, whereas previously, I would ha have to tap the letter H to go to my pan tool. And then I'd have to go back and select the circle. Uh, we no longer have to do that because of the roller ball. Now, uh, as for panning around a design, another way to do that is bottom right hand corner this tiny little magnifying glass, you'll, you'll see that when I put my cursor in that area, it turns to a large plus. Left click gives me what's called a nano preview, and I can scan to wherever I want to in the design. Let me go get that other ellipse. Oh, it's a great way to move around the document and start doing what you need to do. Alternatively, I can hit the letter N on the keyboard, N stands for Nano, or Nano Preview, and it allows me to move around the screen. So again, great way to navigate the screen. Uh, another one is Shift F2. Shift F2 will zoom to whatever is selected. If I select this element and Shift F2, it will, again, it will zoom to whatever is selected. Let's get back on track. I want to grab my freehand drawing tool, and I've already told you that if I left click here, I'm going to come up here and double click. That's now joined. I'm going to double click here and I'm just double clicking around this element and single click here. I'll do a 
single click, double, double, single. Now I'm going to grab my shape tool. I'll select this element. I'll marquee select it. I've now selected all of the nodes within that. And I'm going to convert them to curves. This now allows me, click over here to deselect, this now allows me to take this line and change the shape of it. So very quick, very easy, I'm able to recreate this particular shape. Now, if I pull this down, if I can't quite get this where I want it, I can double click anywhere along the way and it will allow me to add another node. This element here, marquee selected, convert it to a curve. Let me zoom in more. I'm doing this very quick, but you get the idea. And I'm happy with that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'll tap my space bar. And there's another shortcut key. The space bar will toggle back and forth between whatever tool you currently have selected and the pick tool. So if I select an ellipse, draw an ellipse, it basically toggles it back and forth for me from the pick tool to whatever the uh, last tool was selected. I'm going to take this element. I'll do a control D to duplicate that. I'll move this down here. And I'm, I'm happy with that. We're just going to do this very quick. If I now take this element, hold the shift key down and select that, I'll make that whatever color I want. doesn't really matter. I'll take this element. I'll make it a different color. And now if I marquee select these two, remember our combine. The combine creates a knockout. Click on combine. And there is my version of that object that I just created. So fairly simple, fairly straightforward uh, to do that sort of thing. Shift F4 will zoom to my entire design. Let me just move that back on the page and I'll go down my next page. Um, next one I want to talk about is the outline tool. Uh, in the workspace customization, something that's not on by default is the uh, outline pen dialog box. Uh, if I am using my um, uh, default workspace, I do not have the outline pen tool in here. I can click on this plus and this will allow me to customize this toolbox and I can bring the outline pen uh, back in. And there's the flyout. It's just added that to it. And so now I can access my outline, outline pen dialog box. Let me go back to my document. I'm going to uh, create an element. And one of the things that we've changed is, uh, let me give this an outline. I'll make that outline a little bit on the heavy just to, to demonstrate this. And let's give it a solid fill. Let's pick something not too hard. And now, in X6, the outline would actually straddle half on and half off of my object. And you can actually see the sizing handles are right within the actual outline as opposed to beyond that. If I go to um, object, uh, sorry, um, let's go back to my classic view. If I go to arrange and then convert outline to object, and I now go wireframe, letter W, you can see that I have move that over a bit and get out of wireframe, you can see that this red line actually straddles half on and half off. I do undo a couple of times and now if I go into my outline pen dialog box, you'll see that we now have the ability to set the position of the line. By default, it's in the middle position. We can go outside or we can go inside. If I go inside, I'll click OK. My outline is now within the element itself versus completely outside the element. This is great for sign makers. If a customer says to you, I want my company name, which is, um, oh, I don't want to say Panasonic, and uh, that's going to be uh, 15 feet long because it's on a large building, and I need a large white outline around the perimeter of it. Well, if I did a large white outline on a 15-foot 
piece of text, my piece of text might be 15 feet 3 inches. Well, that's not what the specs call for. So this basically allows me to put the inside, the outline on the inside to make it exactly 15 feet. So that's uh, something we've, we've changed in X7. Now we were talking about shaping and crop tools and that sort of thing, or shaping, shaping and creating objects. I'm going to go into my crop tool, click and hold, and you'll notice that because I have my toolbars unlocked, I can actually come into this crop tool, click on this dotted line, and I can pull that right off. If I wanted to, I can dock this up here. And, well, that's interesting. Where'd you come from? Let me just try something here. Go in my crop tool, and drag that right up there. Okay, I'm not sure where that, uh, <laughs> what happened there, but that was kind of interesting. Now, um, the something I should point out here, uh, and uh, this is my first time using it. Well, actually, let's. I'll, I'll get to it in a second. So here is um, here's an element. This is a vector object. We know that because of the status bar. It's a group of 41 objects. If I grab my crop tool, I can actually crop an area out of this. Now. Let me just undo this for a second. Uh, a common question we get from customers, I'm going to grab my crop tool, I want to crop this element, and wait a minute, what happened to the rest of my artwork? That's a common question we get. Why did I lose everything on the page? Well, the reason we did, let me just do an undo, control Z, the reason we did is because we didn't have anything selected. And when I use the crop tool, the application is saying, I want just this element, so I'm going to delete everything else. If I select this element and then grab my crop tool, I just hit the space bar, I can crop the area that I want, double click it, and now I can go ahead and I can use this. You can see it's 36 objects, but it's still a vector. The knife tool, now you'll notice here um, that it's actually highlighted in blue. Anything you see in your application that's highlighted in blue, actually if you go to the help menu, and highlight premium features. Anything that's in blue is a premium feature, and if you do not have a premium membership, then you will not have access to this feature. That being said, CorelDRAW Graphics Suite X7 standard members do have a knife tool. The knife tool will basically allow me to uh, grab an element, I can click, and come down to another area and click there, and it will actually allow me to cut that. Um, just like this. Just a minute now. So that's actually cut that. I'll have to experiment with this one a little bit. Uh, as I say, it is a brand new tool to me. I have not used it before. Uh, so let me, let me, uh, uh, defer this to another time if you do want to find out more information about this tool or what I can do maybe this might be the best way to do it let me just go in and I'm going to launch CorelDRAW Graphics Suite X6 just to show you the knife tool as to what your knife tool looks like because it really is quite a marvelous tool very good at doing what it's uh, what it's supposed to do let's let uh, CorelDRAW launch in the background in the meantime um, oh wait a second now now it looks as though I can show you the knife tool in here. Perfect. Okay, let's ignore X6. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so here's my um, tool. Let me just close this off. So with the knife tool selected, you'll notice that as I get close to the edge, it will stand up. Left click, let the mouse button go. I can move to another area and left click there. That's actually created two separate elements out of that. Tap my space bar. I can left click, hold the mouse button down, and I can actually draw irregular shapes. I can draw whatever element that I want. Come back up to here and let the mouse button go, or I can tap the tab key 
and it will toggle back and forth and allow me to pick the element that I want to keep. So the knife tool works quite nicely like that. Um, one of the other uh, cutting tools that we have up there is the Virtual Segment Delete tool. Now the Virtual Segment Delete tool allows me to take uh, a portion of an object, and I'll show you this way first. It allows me to take a portion of an object and it sees that as a separate segment. So for example, if I want to open up this circle, I'll draw a line across it, it will see this as a separate segment, and I simply hit the delete key, and there we have it. Simple as that. So if I had a, uh, a design like this, with my virtual segment, I can actually click in different areas here and remove these lines. I can also left click and drag a frame, and it would delete all the elements that that frame touches. So it's a great way to remove objects within a design. And uh, then of course there's also the eraser tool and the, with it selected. So I've, I've just erased the center of that. Of course you can change your size of the eraser. I can also change the pressure and that sort of thing. So this is now uh, an object that uh, is, uh, is, is uh, hollow. Uh, I'm going to take these two elements, Control-D to duplicate that, and I'll move this up. And if I hold the Control key down when I move, it's going to keep it perfectly straight up and down. Uh, if I start my movement sideways, and I hold the Control key down, it will keep it sideways as well. So I'm just going to take that, bring it up to about there. I'm going to draw a couple of lines. You'll notice that as I go to the edge, it's telling me I'm on the edge. Here I'm on the quadrant, so left click. And another tool that we have is the Smart Fill tool. Now the Smart Fill tool will create an um, object out of a void. So for example, if I draw a rectangle right here, a rectangle is a bad example, let me draw an ellipse. Ellipse is Canadian for circle. I can take my Smart Fill, I can click in here, and now I've effectively created that element. If I click in, oh, sorry, if I click in here, I've basically created that shape. So using that tool, let me change the color, I'm going to go with red. Actually, let me grab my uh, Virtual Segment Delete tool first, and let me delete a few segments in here. And now I'm going to grab my Smart Fill tool. I will make this red, this blue, and I'll do a dark blue for the inside. So very quick, very easy. I've taken a couple of ellipses and I've created a uh, three-dimensional object. Uh, Shift F4 zooms me to the entire page, and then of course page down. Uh, next I want to talk about is Power Clip. Now I've mentioned Power Clip once already. Power Clip basically allows me to take an element or group of elements and put it inside a container. Now that container can be a single object, a group of objects, or it can be text. So here we have a piece of text that has a drop shadow attached to it. And here we have a bitmap image. So from the effects down to Power Clip, place inside frame, and now I'm just going to simply point on the frame. That's all there is to it. I'll do a control Z because I'm all about doing things the easy way. Right click and drag power clip inside. Okay, Much easier. Control click on this that brings me into the edit mode and I can move this around wherever I want to. Shift that over a little bit and then control click outside of the power clip container takes me out of edit mode. Alternatively, I could right click and edit power clip. I can go to my effects menu, um, power clip, edit power clip, or I can click on this little icon here. So one of the nice things about CurlDraw is there's many, many different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, but power clip 
great little tool, nice feature. Uh, we're going to do a brochure or maybe this is the masthead for a newsletter at a senior's home. All right. Next, we're going to talk about text. Now, in Corel Draw, we have two types of text. We have artistic text and we've got paragraph text. Uh, if, you, if you look at it this way, you pick up a box of uh, uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Now look at the box. The word Kellogg's Corn Flakes on the front of the box is artistic text. On the side panel where you have your list of ingredients, or on the back where you have your contest rules, that's paragraph text. Artistic text, you can, uh, you can typically distort. This is artistic text here. So you can distort that. You can uh, do a number of different things uh, with it. Paragraph text is uh, more for ad copy. If you're doing an instruction manual, it's going to be the directions. Uh, it would be paragraph text. So paragraph text allows you to create drop caps, bullets, left and right justification, uh, line indents, and that sort of thing. To create artistic text, you grab the text tool, left click on the page, and type. That's all there is to it. This is artistic text. I can change the size of it. I can change my font. I can change the color. I can do special effects to it. Here I'm going to add a drop shadow. And now I'm going to take this piece of text and I'm going to put it into an envelope. So I can do a number of different things to artistic text. Sorry. Um, paragraph text, the same tool, but I left click and drag. And that was a spelling mistake on purpose. You'll notice that anything is misspelled. I have the ability to right click on it and pick up what it should be. Uh, so there is spell checker in there as well. Uh, this is paragraph text. Again, you have the ability of uh, bold, italicized, underlined. I can do bullets and drop caps, a number of different things with that. Now, if you're doing a, a, a layout or a design and you're not sure what is a good font to use. We've got something called the Font Playground. If I go to my text menu, I go down to Font Playground, it's going to open up on the right hand side, and I want a piece of text. I'm doing uh, a senior's home. Let's pick Sunset Heights. I'm going to type in here You'll notice that I type the string of text, and I can go through here. Here's a couple of different font samples. I don't like this one. I'm going to highlight that, and let's pick. Let's try Cooper Black. Let me add another sample. I'll make that other sample Cooper Black outline, and I can actually go through and see which one looks the best. This is kind of neat. I think I'll go with that one. So all I need to do is click on Copy. And then if I do a control V on my desktop, uh, it will actually paste that in there for me in that font. And now I can go ahead and I can continue using it. So the font playground basically allows you to get a preview or a sample of what that font may look like. Next thing, when we talk about text, there's a tool called What the Font. I have that selected from my text menu. I'll go down to What the Font. And what that's going to do is it's going to launch Quill Capture in the background. My icon is going to change to this bullseye. I call it a bullseye. And I'm simply going to select the text that I want to try and determine what font that is. And I think I've got it right there. Let me just drop this down a bit. I probably should have zoomed in a little bit first, but got that selected. Simply double click in the center. It's going to launch this web browser. And now here, I'm going to indicate what these letters are. So this is a W. Sometimes it will automatically tell me what they are. Now this is a dot above the I. So let's just move that in place. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there.
Let's see what it does. Uh, it shouldn't have done that. It's gone through and uh, it, it seems to have uh, lost my image. Let me just try that again. Text. What the font. Marquee select the area that we want. It launches the browser. This is better. W E S T. This is the dot above the I. T. This is a T, not an uppercase I. This is a lowercase I. N. This is a G. and I'll click continue. It's going out, it's looking at the catalog, I can scroll through, and this to me looks like a pretty close one, that very first one. Um, a slight difference on the, ta on the ear for the G, but that font is actually pretty close. So I can now go in on this page and I can actually purchase the font, or maybe I can check my system to see if I have it, or just do a Google search for it uh, and search online. But it's a great way to determine what font is being used in the particular design. Okay, uh, next I want to talk about is uh, text on a path. Now I have an ellipse drawn around there or a shape around there. That's actually a boundary. And the way I did that, let me get rid of that boundary. With this object selected, Arrange Shaping Boundary. That's all there is to it. And that's going to create a boundary for me around this object. I can now take my piece of text, right click and drag, and fit text to path. There's a small red glyph here. You probably can't see it, but it allows me to move that text and position it wherever I want to. Now with this piece of text, I want to have that wrapped around the bottom. I can't just right click and drag and fit text to path because this is no longer a path, it's a compound object. So I'm going to use my toolbar that I created and I'm now going to position that text. You'll note the red beam, I'm at the 6 o'clock. Here I'm centered at the 3 o'clock and at the 9 o'clock position. I'm going to put this right here and I want to flip that around so I'm going to use my mirror command horizontally and vertically, and now I can grab this little glyph and just move that up a little bit, and now I'm ready to go, ready to send that off and create a button, a patch, a logo, or whatever I want to do. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this uh, paragraph text right now. Uh, this I do apologize for, but I'm not going to because I think it's pretty cool. Anyway, uh, we do support, and uh, as of X6, we've uh, started to support for open type fonts. Open type fonts are fonts that have additional uh, stylistic sets, uh, they're, they're called. Uh, things such as ligatures and swashes and that sort of thing. This is the Gabriola font, a standard font within Windows, uh, Windows 7 and Windows 8 only. I can select this piece of text. You'll notice this downward pointing arrow. I call that a chicken beak. If I click on that, you'll see excuse me, you'll see that I have a number of different uh, styles that I can apply to that piece of text. So it really is making it nice and easy if I wanted to create a, a wedding invite or, or something like that to create a nice uh, flowery or nice stylistic uh, piece of text. Um, one other thing with respect to text, I can uh, take this piece of text and slide that in, or this object and slide it in, but first I want to wrap paragraph text. And now if I move this in, you'll see that my text is going to move, it's going to change shape. Let's do it with this one as well. Now that square, what I'm going to do is I will right click this, go to Object Properties, it's going to open up my Docker. And in here I can dictate how I want that to wrap. So this now will wrap around the contour of that object quite nicely. I can do the same with the arrow. 
and actually have it wrap around that. This is great for creating newsletters and that sort of thing. Got to look at my time here and make sure we get everything covered off. Uh, I mentioned a uh, lens briefly, but uh, a lens is basically a, uh, an element that has transparency to it. So if I took this object and put it over top of this vehicle, I'm going to go to my Windows menu, down to Dockers, and then down to Effects and Lenses. In here, there's a number of different lenses that we have. I can do a Brighten Lens. I'll drag and drop that over top. That has made it 50% brighter. I can drop this down 5% brighter or I can go into the negative range and make that area darker. So I may want to put a lens over top of an entire object and make it brighter or darker. I can certainly do that. Uh, color limit, there's uh, different things such as fisheye is a fun one. I'll put this over top of the headlight. And this now has given a fisheye effect to that area. I can adjust the amount of distortion that, that gets. Uh, magnifying is another good one. So this will actually magnify that area. Let me drop that down a bit. If you wanted to create a, a magnifying glass, uh, you could certainly do something like that. We also have frozen and viewpoint. If I select frozen and then click apply, it will actually take whatever is in that magnifying glass and it will allow me to uh, move the glass elsewhere with whatever was in there in that position. So it's a I can now you know, put a handle on here and that sort of thing, so it's a great way to create a magnifying glass. Other types of lenses we have uh, is, uh, call, or sorry, uh, we also have something called a transparency, which is a type of lens. A transparency is this icon right here. Uh, let's use it from my toolbox up above. And I can drag and bring this out here. Oh, actually, let me just uh, give that a color fill. And now if I grab my transparency, you can see that I've actually gotten a bit of a gradu graduation on this. Now the way this particular tool works, and it is new for those that have upgraded from X6 uh, or from a previous version to X7, this tool and these controls are brand new. The way this works basically is this tool, uh, this here, in and out, allows me to do the, the transparency the way it's always been. What the other tool does is it allows me to flatten or squash the transparency. And it's easier to demonstrate that if I was to draw an ellipse. And I'm going to give it a, uh, well, let's give it a fountain fill. This has the same control. I'm going to leave that little white dot alone for a moment. And let me drag and drop some colors onto this line. So now we have a, a graduated fill. Uh, let me put the yellow in the middle. And I'm going to make that elliptical. So here we have a, a nice little graduated fill. I can play with that. This allows me to flatten it. So it's filled the rest of it in in black. And that's typically how this particular tool will work. So very, very flexible for something like that. I want to go to this particular image here. And I want to make a little bit of a transparency from here to here. And what you'll see is I now have the beginning of a nice little design. I'm going to tap my space bar, which is going to put me onto the pick tool. Uh, one tool I didn't tell you about in selecting is the Alt key. It's considered the bigger tool. And in fact, let me go back to this object here just to show you. And you see how quick I did that? Tap the letter S for page sorter view. I'm going to take this element. I'll hold the shift key down and I'll resize it. It's going to resize from the center out. And let's give this a uniform transparency. 
And now I'm going to hold the Alt key down and I'll click here. And you'll see my orange object is selected. Let me go into the Object Manager. And here I am right here. Sorry, that's my red object selected. I click again with the Alt key. It's selected magenta, the purple. And each time I click it with the Alt key held down, it's going down one level. So we call that the digger tool. It's digging down individual levels. And all I'm doing is holding down the Alt key, and I just keep digging and goes down individual letters uh, levels. So with that in mind, Shift F2. Tap my, oops, just a second here. It's interesting. Bear with me for a second. Okay, so what ha what's, ha what's happening there, ladies and gentlemen? Um, I'm going to log this as an issue. Uh, tapping the space bar is turning me to the last tool. In this scenario, my last state is what it's doing, is page sorter view. So that's tossing me back and forth between page sorter view and... All right, so anyway, I've got that. Let me grab my transparency tool, and now I can go back and forth safely. All right, so I've got the top image selected. I tap my space bar. I hold the Alt key down and I click. I now have the second bitmap selected. I tap my spacebar again. I'll get my transparency. And here I'm just going to do a little bit of a transparency straight up. So very quick and very easy. I've created a, a nice little design with three bitmaps. If I pull these across, or apart rather, and this is all done with nothing more than the transparency tool. These are the three images that I just used to create that design. So again, undoing those, that's a neat little tool to, to play with. Okay. Um, one other thing we've added to uh, Corel Draw Graphics Suite X7 is QR, our QR codes. From the Edit menu, I can go down, I can insert a QR code. Uh, it's dropped that in for me. And now what I can do is I can go to Object Properties, and this is the address by default on that QR code. Uh, I can type in my own company address. I can type in uh, phone number, contact information, calendar event, geolocation, and, of course, plain text. So if you want to do a T-shirt design, um, and actually I have a T-shirt that I did up with a QR code on it, and uh, somebody scans it, it simply says you'll have to scan it and see. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what my shirt says with a QR code, but anyway, that's another story. Um, very easy to insert QR codes. Once you've put a code in, uh, say www.abc.com, you'll need to validate it. And what that does is it goes out to a validation server to make sure that this particular design will actually take you to where you want it to do. And when I say this particular design, we do have the ability of changing colors. I can add fills. I can even add graphic images into the QR code. And of course, once I've done that, then I'll want to validate it, make sure it's still working. Uh, we've done an awful lot with the uh, Object Properties Docker and the Fills Docker, make it very easy to change fills and that sort of thing. Uh, so here we have uh, the fill. I can add colors along the way. I can change these colors. I do a number of different things with those. Maybe dial up a different color. Let's go in purple. Uh, so very easy to um, do live manipulation on screen and uh, and see how that's going to look within the design. Uh, the next is working with styles. And let me just close off all of my dockers. And I'm going to go up to Windows, Dockers, down to Object Styles. Now, for those that use uh, a word processor or a text processor, 
you're familiar with uh, with styles uh, where you have headers and footers and uh, maybe heading one, heading two. When I wrote my book, it was uh, um, I had that, I think I had seven different styles that I had to use depending on whether it was a first level heading, a second level heading, a, a tip, a bullet, or whatever the case may be. But um, so uh, I, I, I quickly learned how to use styles and use them quite effectively. A style basically allows me to quickly and easily change characteristics of, or properties within a document quickly. I'm going to take this, uh, this element here. I'll drag and drop that into the style set. I've now created a style for that element. All I need to do is select these objects. I'm going to hold the shift key down. I'll select these two as well. And I'm going to apply that style to it. Now, where it comes in handy is I need to create another image. So I'm going to have number six over here, and I'll bring in my artwork. I'll type in my text, whatever the case may be. I then simply select this element here, and I click on Apply to Select It. It now has the same style as the other ones. Boss comes to me and says, no, 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 no. you've got that the wrong color. I want this yellow to be the same color as the yellow in the, in the head of the cat. All I need to do is go into my yellow color, Hit the drop down. I'll select my eyedropper, and I can sample colors from everywhere in, or anywhere in the document. I'll click on this orange, and now all of these elements, it's changed it into my styles, but it's also changed it throughout my entire document. So it's a great way to uh, very quickly uh, change elements within the design. Uh, not only do we have uh, Shift F4, not only do we have object styles, but we also have color styles. And I'm simply going to uh, let me grab this element here. If I go into my Windows, Dockers, down to Color Styles, I'm going to drag and drop this element. into here. That's going to allow me to create a style for it. And what's nice about that is I can select this style. I can change the type of color harmony, that sort of thing. I can also move this around and this will allow me to change the color of the vehicle. So it's a great way to get an overall feel of how this is going to look depending on, you know, depending on what color I want to, uh, to, to, to do that with. So it's kind of neat to, uh, to be able to do that. Uh, talked about power clip already. Uh, here's a couple more examples. We saw the uh, power clip in a text. Um, very quick and very easy to do. Uh, this is graph paper tool. Graph paper tool can be created by going underneath the, po the polygon tool and selecting graph paper. And while we talk about polygon, a polygon of course is just, just that. It's a polygon. Uh, I can change the number of sides for that. I can also grab my shape tool and move these nodes in and do a number of things with the polygon, create some pretty cool little designs. But with the, uh, with the graph paper tool, uh, it's great to create a grid and I can take a, an image, right click and drag and power clip inside, and control click and this allows me then to, to edit that element. Where this comes in handy is that I can now ungroup these elements and if I do sublimation, I can print these on ceramic tiles and create a backsplash uh, do any number of things, uh, you know, might be maybe a, a marble tile panel in, in a washroom, uh, in a kitchen, uh, in a hallway, in a restaurant, whatever the case may be. Okay, uh, Power Trace. Now, Power Trace is, uh, we talked at the beginning about raster versus vector. Uh, a raster image is an image made up of pixels, vector or line segments. The main difference is a raster image. If I try to make it too big, it's going to look terrible. Uh, this raster image, I need to have this image. It's currently four inches by or four and a half by four and a half ballpark. Uh, but I need this to be uh, at the top of the, uh, it's going into the high school gym and uh, up on the wall, and I need this 12 feet across. It's not going to happen with this image. So what I'll do is I'll launch Power Trace or Trace. Uh, simply click on Trace Bitmap, and there's a couple of different options. Actually, actually, let's grab this one first. 
So here we have a sketch of a smart car, trace bitmap, line drawing. I'm just going to do this very quick and I'll explain these settings on the next one. Uh, I can bump up my detail and I'm happy with that. I'll click OK and it really is that simple. I can delete the original. I now have a line drawing where I can grab my smart fill tool and I can make myself a nice little car uh, with the headlights. Well, they're pink, but you get the idea. Taillights and headlights. And so very easy to go through. And I'm basically creating a vector artwork uh, that I can group, I can ungroup, I can resize, do whatever I want to. On this particular one here, trace bitmap, under outline trace, there's a couple of different settings. Uh, for the most part, I find clip art is going to be about the best one. It's going to go through, it's going to look at all the uh, raster elements in here, and it's going to create vector objects on this side. That's all there is to it. We're done. Now, you'll notice that it's removed the background for me, except for in this area. Now, I have the ability to remove uh, select which background color, and then I can remove that particular color from the entire image. In this scenario, I don't really want to do that because I don't want to remove the white from the eyes, from around this lettering, or from the headdress. So I'll leave that alone and I'll manually delete these elements afterwards. I have the ability to remove uh, object overlap or group objects together, group objects by color rather. If you're doing this for screen printing, uh, you know, t-shirt printing or, or, or that sort of thing, or even for, for um, uh, vinyl cutting. If you want all of one color to be on the same plate, or if you need, for example, uh, this is currently an, uh, an RGB color, I believe. It's currently an RGB color. If I need that to be a spot color, I can go up to color mode, and I can go and I can select my spot palette. These are now spot colors in here, so I've actually already separated this out. I'm going to simply click OK. And now what I can do in here is I'll just move that aside. Let me delete this. So there is my traced object. Now, I'm just going to do a Control c to copy this. I want to go into a new document just to show you something else. Oh, it's business card size. That's why. I'll make it smaller. That's fine. Now, here's a little trick. If you know there's white objects that you want to delete, but you don't know where they are, I mean, I can't tell where those white objects are I have to delete. If you double-click the rectangle tool, that's going to put a, a frame around your entire page. Now, it's simply a matter of giving it a color, and I can now very easily see, if I select this, I'll select Ungroup, and I can select my white, You'll notice that if I move that out of the way, this is oh, a second here. This is what it's actually moving, and that's because I told it originally to group uh, by color. So if I select the white elements and I now click on ungroup, I can select the white elements that I don't want. And there's my design ready to either cut on vinyl, whatever the case may be. It's a vector file, so I can make this. Uh, it's currently 1.9 by 1.8. I'm just going to group this. Oops. Try that again. I was doing a control F, which is find as opposed to control G. Uh, I can take this, and if I lock that, I can now make this 100, and this is now 100 inches by 91 inches. Shift F4 will zoom, uh, sorry, F4 will zoom to uh, everything that's drawn on the page. We can do a maximum page size of 150 feet by 150 feet. Of course, printing is your problem. Uh, so that's it for that's it for trace, power trace. Let's continue. Let me just see where I am in the in the grand scheme. Uh, I want to make sure that we get the uh, the important things down. We're not doing too bad at all. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, master pages.
and master layers. A master page is a page that you have the ability to put elements on and that it will, those elements will be duplicated on every single page. For example, uh, if I have a, uh, a logo and I want that logo to be a watermark, I can make it fairly faint and I can put it in the center of a, a master page and that watermark logo will be on every single page. It could say draft, it could say final, or it could be a corporate logo, whatever you want. Uh, we can also, on master pages, under my layout menu, I can go insert page number on, uh, on all pages and that will actually drop the page number in for me and if I go to the next page, you'll see that the page number is there. Let's go previous page. So it's automatically put the page numbers in for me. A nice thing about that is going to sorter view. Uh, here we have pages one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to take page five. I'll move it over to this position. It is now page two. So it's automatically renumbered the pages for me, which is, which is quite nice. So that's basically master pages, master layers. Now, Next, I want to talk about is text, uh, a little bit more about text and, and creating layouts. Uh, we added in Corel Draw Graphics Suite X6 the layout toolbar. So right click, select layout. It's going to open up this toolbar for me. In here, I have the ability of converting frames to power clip frames. And it's simply a matter of selecting the element and telling it that I wanted a power clip frame. If for some reason I don't want a power clip frame, then I can undo that, uh, that process as well. But the nice thing about having those as power clip frames is I can very easily drag and drop into that frame. Now this particular one, I'm going to use my drop down menu and simply select center content. So very quick and very easy, uh, it allows me to uh, edit and position these elements. Now, with the paragraph frame selected, one other feature we've added is to be able to right-click, insert placeholder text. This is going to give me the ability to get a visualization as to what this is going to look like. I'm basically creating a newsletter now. So what I want to do is I'm going to start off, I want to give this three column. I'm going to take these, uh, these elements here and I'm going to wrap the text. Oh, just a second here. Now this particular one, it's not really wrapping the way I want it to. So again, I can go right click, go to Object Properties, and have it flow left. So I can certainly do that. Uh, let me make that a little bit smaller. And for whatever reason, oh, I see what it's done. Now the problem is this one here. There we go. And that's fairly straight. So you can see it's fairly easy to uh, create a bit of a layout. Now the one thing you'll notice is this red dotted frame. If my frame is black, then I'm fine. That basically means I can see all my text in the frame. If it's red, that's an indication there's too much text in this frame. If I select this frame and I pull down, you can see I have more text in here than will actually fit. So what I can do is I can cause this text to flow over to the next page. Let's just go ahead and click on this. I'm going to click on my green. I'm going to go to my next page and with this selected, click in here. With this particular cursor, I'll go to my next page. And as I highlight over this area, you can see this faint frame in here. So I left click and drag. And this will allow me to actually create the frame on this side. And now, of course, I'm going to go in, set my number of columns. And now I can continue typing in here. I now have a, a black statement. Very quick and very easy to create a newsletter type uh, uh, of document. 
Okay, uh, next is uh, scripts. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the script. I'm going to watch my time here. Um, scripting is fairly easy, fairly straightforward. Uh, we do ship with a number of uh, scripts within the application. Uh, the uh, calendar script is one that I use regularly. I actually use it once a year. That was a bit of a joke. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've got a... a a nephew that owns a garage and so I do their annual calendars for them that they hand out to their customers and just to show you how easy it is from the tools menu macros and I want to run macro under macros in the calendar wizard is the name of the script and I'm simply going to click on run you'll see here I can pick a year I can select specific months I can select all months or I can do a layout. Now, usually the ones I do for him is uh, year plus 12 small bottom. And that gives me the ability of putting an image in here. I've got my calendar uh, information in here. I can have it automatically adjust the fonts for me. Or I can go in and dictate what font that you want to use, color, size. There's a lot of flexibility in here. It's simply a matter of clicking on generate. It takes all of about 10 or 15 seconds for it to uh, generate the calendar. And I'll simply click on close. Now what I would do is I'm going to take this frame make that smaller. I'll put the year in here. I'll put the company logo. And then, of course, I need to put an image uh, uh, an image in here as well. Uh, because he, um, uh, let's go into uh, just a second here. Oh, I see what the problem is. I'm trying to import an EPS file. Those are JPEG files in there. We'll talk about uh, importing and whatnot in a second. So because he uh, runs a garage, let's pick up a, a car image. And I can now left-click and drag. And this will allow me to dictate the size that this image comes in at. And then I'll right-click, power clip inside. I can control-click on it. And so very quick, very easy, I've created a calendar that uh, he can now give out to the customers. So uh, the scripts in, uh, in CorelDRAW, uh, some of them are quite useful. Uh, another one, of course, is batch resizing. I can do a batch watermarking. Uh, I, maybe I can. Maybe I want to do a color palette sw or like a, a swatch sheet. Uh, if I do uh, screen printing or if I do direct-to-garment printing, I'll pick one of my color palettes and I'll print that out on a cotton t-shirt or something like that. So when a customer comes in to me with a gym bag and says, I need a blue logo that will match this color of gym bag, they can actually take a look at the cotton t-shirt you printed out with your color palette and say, well, this is the color of blue I want. Then you'll, you'll know exactly what color to use. So some of the scripts are very, very useful within the application. And... Uh, Next thing, this is a feature, I'm not going to get too much into bitmaps. Uh, there are a couple of rules to follow in dealing with bitmaps. Um, if you want to find out more about dealing with bitmaps, uh, there's a number of different resources that I can point you to, uh, or you can sign up for one-on-one -on -one training. We can certainly do that. But uh, I'm going to show one feature within uh, uh, PhotoPaint and uh, one, one bit of a workflow uh, type thing within PhotoPaint. If I have an image select and I want to edit this in PhotoPaint, Rather than launching PhotoPaint by itself and bringing the image in, I can simply click on Edit Bitmap, and that will automatically launch PhotoPaint for me with this image in it. Uh, the, the advantage to doing it that way is I can do whatever changes or whatever modification I want to to the image, and then once I've finished that, it's simply a matter of closing out on the image, and uh, I can have my uh, I can do all my uh, my uh, editing, saving the editing in PhotoPaint. So here is my image. Uh, let me close off the Quill Connect. Bear with me for a second. Zoom in. So this particular image I shot this couple years ago. Uh, actually, they'll have their third anniversary this uh, this coming February. Uh, it was a wedding, a destination wedding in Jamaica. I took a look at the shot afterwards. I thought it was kind of nice. Uh, I then noticed this hot spot up here as well as the balloons. 
And so from the image menu, um, I want to go down to Smart Carver. This allows me to brush out areas of the image that I don't want. So I'm just going to highlight this area. And I think I'll take this tree out as well. To do that, let me just bump up my brush size so it'll be a little bit quicker. And any time I'm brushing out an area, if it's close to my subject, I'll want to protect that. So I'm going to draw a stroke down here, and another stroke down here. And I'll simply click on Contract Horizontally. It takes but a second. It's removed the tree. I can click on Background Fusion, and if there's any blemishes where the background is, it'll, it'll address that. I'll click OK, and there's my image. Now all I need to do is close off Photo Paint. I'll say yes to this, and it's going to bring me back into Corel Draw with my image all fixed up. The tree's gone, the balloon's gone, the hot spot, and now I can sell this to the groom for three times the amount. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the session. Now, two pieces of, uh, a, a couple of pieces of information I want to give you, and then I'll open up uh, the lines or the calls for questions. First off is uh, additional, first off are additional resources. So if we go to uh, Corel.com, and that's not Corel.com. <laughs> From Corel.com, I'm going to click on Corel Draw, and then Learning. Under Learning, Bring It Home with Corel Draw, A Guide to In-House Graphic Design. That's my book. Um, it's on sale right now, $24.99. And I think uh, uh, between now and New Year's, there's no shipping or something like that. Don't quote me on that, but there, there may not be. Uh, it's tutorial, 250 pages, tutorial-based. It is based off of X6. I've written it for that it was non-version specific. And uh, you can all of the tutorials that are in there, you can do in Corel Draw X7 and learn quite a bit from it. Uh, the other thing is, if I go back one, online resources, quick start guide. This is a multi-page PDF file that you can download and print out and keep it by your side. It's a great resource. Also, if you go to learn, or actually just click on learning, it might take you there, Discovery Center. And then you can click on graphics. In here, there's a large number of tutorials um, for Corel Draw and how to deal with various things, uh, do various projects, and that sort of thing. Um, 50 Tips and Tricks, that is an ebook. It's a PDF file. Uh, it's actually an excerpt from my book that uh, that's for sale. I think it's $9 or something like that for that. But if you're looking at getting the book, don't get this as well. Although this does have some nice graphic images in it. <laughs> uh, but there are um, uh, a number of tutorials here that you can access that will help you uh, uh, learn the application that much better. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, open the lines uh, there may be a bit of an issue with some feedback, so I may have to mute some people and uh, answer the questions that was, uh, at a t one at a time. Now, um, there are some people who do not have access to a microphone. Uh, those that do not, um, do feel free to uh, type into the chat window any questions that you may have, uh, and I'll answer those. Um, Bill, do you have any questions, sir? All right, no sir. Okay, not a problem at all. Um, Dick, do you have any questions, sir? Uh, uh, Edward, how about yourself? Do you have any questions, sir? No, not at this time. Perfect. Uh, Jeannie, how about yourself? Okay. Uh, Kevin, uh, it, it looks as though you do not have access to a microphone. Do feel free, or, or can you hear me, Kevin? Okay, Kevin, do feel free to type any questions in that you may have into the um, into the questions panel. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me now? 
I can hear somebody who said hello. Who was that? That's Kevin. Yes, Kevin. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, will y'all be uploading this to the YouTube channel or through yeah. Braille Draw? No, no. This, this session does not get uploaded anywhere. Uh, this is a basic introductory session that we typically don't record them or, or upload. Uh, those that do have the annual membership, uh, you are entitled to, to attend this uh, once a month for the entire year. Um, okay. Uh, any, any questions on the content or any questions that you haven't seen that you'd like to see something from? Well, you pretty much covered it pretty fast, but I know we're uh, pressed for time. All right. All right, perfect. Uh, Robin, you're quite welcome, Kevin. Robin, do you have any questions, sir, or ma'am? Um, no, no, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Shari, how, how about yourself? Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, Dick, do you, oh, Dick is offline. Uh, I'm going to be ending this session very, very soon. Uh, just one shout out. Is there anybody else who has any questions? Any, any? I do. I uh, go ahead. Uh, will will y'all be sending out next month? Will y'all be doing the same thing as well? Sending an email to us, letting us know when the date is going to be. Uh, the the date of the next one is actually posted on our website, and I can show you that right now. If we go to learning, the microphones. We got too much noise there. Um, so uh, I went to learning introductory webinars and right down here view schedule of upcoming sessions. So the next one posted for Corel Draw is going to be January 22nd from 10 a.m. till 12 p.m. So will that be uh, oh, will that be over Corel Draw seven? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Which version of CorelDRAW do you have, sir? Seven. Okay, yeah. Thanks, yeah. seven. We, yeah, we typically do not do the version. I've got a lot of noise coming in. Yeah, I, I can't hear you. Is that better? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Should I advertise who, who was making all the noise? <laughs> uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, are there any final questions before I end the session? Okay. Good. Were you going to say something, Kevin? Yeah, you, the, the last piece you did with the power clip when you, uh, well, when you was in photo paint, you took the, the uh, balloons out and it covered, and how did it cover up with the, like, the background graphics? How did you do that? Uh, that's done with that particular tool. It's called Smart Carver, and it, it's done with that specific tool. So the smart curver is in Corel uh, Photo Paint. The smart car that's correct. Smart curver is in Photo Paint, and uh, I actually accessed Photo Paint by going through um, Corel Draw. So here's the image with the balloons. Selecting Etiquette Map will launch Photo Paint. And then from my uh, image menu. From my image menu, Smart Carver, and I indicate what elements I want to remove. And that's all there is to it. It did not it did not crop it off. It did shorten the image, but I can extend it back out again if I wanted to. It's not a problem. But you can see that the, the balloons were actually tied to this piece here. So it didn't actually crop it. It, it removed them. Um, the same with my tree here. So the red is to remove and the green is to put back? That's correct. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, red is to remove, green is to protect. Oh, protect, okay. Yeah. If I didn't use the green and I'm selecting an area that is close to my subject,
No, it's not too bad, but I do have a bit of distortion by the arm here. Uh, but oh, okay. it, it, it's basically to protect uh, your your subject. Okay, and when I do find do when I do protect it and put uh, get it on the piece that I want, the smart curves. What is the arrow for? What are the, what are the different arrows for? These arrows down here, you mean? Yes. That, that, that basically produ that basically processes it. So once you've indicated the areas that you want to remove and protect, simply click on this icon here, upper right corner. Okay. Okay. So the upper right corner. Yep. Okay. All right, sir. Great. Great. I'm going. Great. To, uh, Thank you. My pleasure. I'm going to uh, end this session off now. I want to thank everybody uh, very much for attending. It's been a lot of fun for me. And uh, do feel free to um, uh, check back. Uh, you know, if you're looking for one-on-one -on -one sessions, we certainly do conduct those. Uh, Learn.corel.com will give you access to the Discovery Center. And then, of course, Corel.com. Um, and then um, under the, um, the Learn gives you access to the PDF file and the uh, and access to my book. Again, thanks very much. Have a great day. And uh, to all those, happy holidays. Yeah. Same to you.